So uh, take your time. Um, hopefully the name of the talk will become evident as we go throughout the talk. Um, but first, some introductory stuff. I'm Ben. Um, I learned how to use Opacity for this talk, so you can actually layer stuff on top of things, um, <laughs> which is a real advancement for me in my graphic design. I'm the software architect at Bleacher Report. I've been there for about three and a half years. And this is I just realized recently that this is the longest I've ever worked in one place at any time in my life. So that's either a really good thing or a really bad thing. And I think it's a good thing. Um, we've been using Elixir for about four years. Um, and it also recently occurred to me, I was talking to Chris last night, that all of our apps that have been using Phoenix, um, almost all of them are up to the latest version of Phoenix with the new directory structure and the latest version of Elixir. And that's both a testament to uh, the Phoenix and Elixir teams for how well they manage their upgrade process. And it's also, I guess, good for us because we've been able to, to not repeat the same mistakes of the past that we did with Ruby where we let tech debt overtake things. Um, and you know, I've talked about Bleacher Report a bunch over the, last, over the last years, and now that we've moved everything to Elixir and Phoenix mostly, um, now's the time for us to do some more ambitious work. So we've hired a bunch of people, about 10 people over the last year, um, <coughs> and we're continuing to hire. So if you're looking, if you're a mobile, mobile developer or React developer, we do remote and uh, SF-based. And one of the nice things I've mentioned earlier is that with Elixir, you can do more with fewer developers, and so now we're hiring all these developers, so does that mean you cannot you can no longer do that. And that's not the case. Rather, we just have ambitious projects over the next couple of years. So we're, we're working on turning the app into a platform so that you can engage, and as opposed to just uh, reading news or whatever, you can actually engage and interact with the app. So that's sort of the big plan for the next couple of years. Um, so that's sort of all I'm going to talk about Bleach Report for the most part. Um, I feel self-conscious about this, but I wrote a book with Jose and Bruce. Um, so, And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because here's a I discount code, so if you would like to buy the book or if you have any questions, um, I'm around afterwards to chat about these kind of things. Um, so the preamble's over. Now we can actually get to the topic at hand. Um, so I'm going to briefly lay out the four or five different sections that we're going to talk about. The first is how Erlang schedules work. Then we're going to briefly talk about what NIPs are and why they're relevant to this topic. And then we're going to spend a bit of time, or about a third of the time, on dirty schedulers, what they are, how they relate to NIFs and regular schedules, schedulers. We're going to talk about Rust, um, why Rust makes sense, uh, why Rust is a good alternative to C, uh, both in general and specifically to Elixir and Erlang. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with NIFs or NAY, in the sense that should you use NIFs, why not use NIFs, um, what are some alternatives to these things. And given the information that we've gone through in this talk, Maybe that'll be persuasive or not. So let's start with, with the Erlang schedulers. Um, and for me, the easiest way to visualize schedulers is to use the observer. I would assume that most people have used the observer before. And if you haven't, it's an amazing tool. It comes with Erlang. And it's a really nice way to visualize how the Erlang virtual machine works. You can get all this information um, right off the top. Um, in this case, the thing that I want to point out is that this was from OTP20. Um, and it'll be apparent why in a bit. And there are eight schedulers. Um, each core on your machine has one scheduler. Um, and the thing is, is that you would think that uh, schedulers are bound to their cores, but that's not necessarily the case. Schedulers can jump from core to core. Um, and James Fish actually was the one who pointed that out to me. A while ago, we were talking about simple ways to optimize uh, the VM, and he suggested using their URL flags to bind the schedulers to their cores. So you'll get a little bit of a performance boost out of that. So the scheduler will stay that core and won't jump around at all. And that was the only improvement we've really, or that was the only optimization that we've had to do with the VM. And that did help us out a bit. So it's something to check out. Um, do note that it's only optional, it's only possible on Linux. So if you try to do it on your local machine and it's a Mac, it won't work. So that's something to keep in mind. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of the Erlang schedulers. And this isn't a deep dive into the schedulers. This is just a way to get an, a general idea of what the schedulers are. So first, uh, Erlang schedulers are preemptive. So preemptive schedulers context switch among running tasks and have the power to preempt tasks um, and resume them at a later time without the cooperation of the uh, preempted tasks. And this is done based on some factors, uh, whether that's priority or time slices or reductions. And we'll come back to time slices and reductions in a bit, but just keep that in mind. And this is in contrast to cooperative schedulers. Uh, cooperative schedulers need the task cooperation for context switching, as the name implies. Um, the scheduler simply lets running tasks voluntarily release control periodically or when they're idle, um, and then starts a new task and again waits for it to return the control back voluntarily. And the reason I just bring that up is just to make that distinction between the two. 
but the same takeaway is that preemptive implies interruption, and it implies interruption based on some factor, in this case, time slices, reductions, or priority. So each scheduler has a run queue. Um, the run queue is essentially the amount of work that that scheduler has to, has to, has to deal with, uh, really loosely speaking. Um, and this is a really good metric if, you have, if you're using Elixir in production to monitor the run queue and to check that out. Um, and it's a good place to identify bottlenecks. This is something that we found out when we were working uh, with a problem we had, um, I don't know, maybe six months ago at this time. Uh, but basically, we, you know, our traffic is, is eternally spiky. So you know, we, some, some breaking news happens or, or something happens, and we'll get these giant spikes. Um, and now our spikes are four to five, six times what they were before. So we've managed to increase the, the, uh, the range of spikes by quite a lot. And using the run queue, we were able to identify exactly where the, pro where the app was breaking down and worked to ameliorate that. And then another important component of these schedulers is the migration logic. Um, migration logic is pretty much what you expect it, would sound, expect it to be. Um, and it's basically, it's basically a load balancer for the different schedulers. Um, it, it assigns work to different schedulers. It can, if a scheduler is overloaded, it can take one and put it somewhere else. And it can do some various other things about collecting statistics about the max length of all scheduler run queues and do some average for run queue and, and various other things. But again, if you want to have a simple idea in your mind, the thing that, uh, that the migration logic does is essentially a load balancer for schedulers. So now that we have discussed these three, three topics at a very high level, this is more or less what it looks like from a uh, diagram point of view. So you have work come in, migration logic is responsible for assigning that work to a run queue, which is bound to a scheduler. And so in this case, we have one, two, and some number of schedulers. Um, and this was changed in our 13B, so uh, the 13th release, um, so that each scheduler has its own run queue before it was just one run queue. And the reason that each scheduler has its own run queue is because it decreases the number of lock conflicts in the system and it improves overall performance. And so as we've talked about these different characteristics of the early language schedulers, all of this is to say that this is a very finely tuned machine. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we haven't, we haven't made any um, optimizations or any other things with regard to the virtual machine, with, regard, uh, with the exception of um, adding the, binding the schedulers to their cores. And all of the VM guarantees that you hear about uh, that make Erlang and Elixir such a wonderful choice for a language, they're all predicated on the fact that, that these things take place. Um, one millisecond is the time slice uh, that we've been talking about, and that's uh, when I was talking about the preemptive characteristics earlier. Um, and on the reduction side, there's not really a definitive definition for reduction, but it's essentially a per-process counter that is incremented by one per function call. And then the reduction count reaches 2,000, the task is preempted and context is switched. So these are the, these are the characteristics uh, which govern the schedulers and making sure that everything is working the way it should be working. And so what happens in the event that these things fall apart? Well, you have scheduler collapse. And this, I mean, we've had this at work uh, when, when, the schedule, when we've had um, bottlenecks and you see things behaving erratically and not the ways that you would expect them to do. So there are two ways that you can cause uh, schedule collapse. One can be caused by misbehaving standard Erlang functions or, lo or long garbage collections. So that's an interesting thing um, because you would expect that standard functions wouldn't cause these problems, but you have to be careful with that as well. Um, and then probably the, the more famous example uh, would be misbehaving NIFs. Like this NIFs are, for, for the various characteristics, can cause problems, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So that's roughly, roughly all I want to talk about from a scheduler point of view. And the takeaways from this section are that each core is a scheduler, the scheduler, schedulers are preemptive, that each scheduler has a run queue, and mig migration logic is what divvies up the work, and everything is expected to work in tandem. All of, these, all of these conditions are expected to be met. And if things start to go out of whack, then you have schedule collapse or un other unexpected behavior. So now we're going to talk about NIFs and very briefly talk about NIFs. Um, so NIFs are natively implemented functions. Uh, and actually, uh, last year in this room, uh, Andrew Bennett gave a talk called Well-Behaved Native Implemented Functions for Elixir. And it's an excellent talk. Um, he gives a lot of empirical evidence about how to use different types of NIFs. And uh, it's a very thorough approach to different kinds of NIFs. And if you're interested in NIFs, then I would highly recommend that you watch that talk. But for, the, for our purposes, let's suffice to say that C's are written in NIF, uh, sorry, that NIFs are written in C. 
predicate subject. It's hard sometimes. Um, and so uh, with C, you, lose the, you can potentially lose the guarantees. Um, and there's a risk um, that functions implemented in C may have different, may not, um, may take more clock cycles per reduction than normal Erlang function. And it's a prerequisite for every time you mention uh, NIFs that you have this warning or every article that, has in, that writes about NIFs or, or any kind of NIF type stuff, there's always going to be a warning about this because, and it's, it's well-deserved warning because you really do, if, you, if your NIF crashes, you can crash the entire VM so that you, you lose all the guarantees right away. Um, and even if you don't crash the VM, you can cause some, some odd behavior. Um, and this, is the, this last part is the part that I would like to focus on, um, a native function doing lengthy work before uh, returning degrades responsiveness of the VM and can cause miscellaneous strange behaviors. Um, and this is sort of what ties everything together with the, the name of the talk and what we've been talking about before about how, how normal schedulers function, uh, how they can break down what NIFs are in this context. Uh, and that's, and then of course, I would assume that most people know why you use NIFs and that's used for speed or competition uh, or um, computation rather, um, and to make sure that you understand the, the consequences of, of what happens if you have a badly behaving NIF. Um, and the most famous or the most recognizable library, NIF, li NIF using library off the top of my mind is Jiffy. That's a JSON encoding decoding library. And we use that at work um, for some of our applications and we've never had an issue with that. So it, it's possible to use NIFs without any problems. Um, but I would say that most things can probably be done with Erlang with the exception of, with some, with some exceptions. Um, and the reason that we need to use Jiffy is because of the high level of traffic that we have. So our use cases may be the exception, not the rule. So now let's get into what uh, dirty schedulers are. Um, so now, as you know, I mentioned before, we have the schedulers that are bound by these various constraints. Um, and so dirty schedulers are a alternative to that. Um, this is a, a nice quote. Due to heroic efforts by Steve Vinosky, Rich, Ricard Green, and Sverka Eriksson, we have an experimental so-called dirty scheduler API in the Erlang runtime, which has been somewhat stable since 17.3. And there are a number of things that, that's, that come, speak out to me from this quote. Um, the first is that it, it's been somewhat stable I'm not sure what the exact definition of somewhat stable is. I would be curious to hear what the strict definition of somewhat stable is. Second, 17.3, if you know, Erlang OTP releases, major releases are, are yearly, so that means it's almost four years ago that this has been uh, worked on. And the fact that he uses, uh, the, the author uses the, the, the word heroic to describe these efforts. Um, what is, you know, why, why would you say heroic? That's a, quite a, a bold proclamation. And to me, it goes back to the fact that you know, especially with, with regard to Erlang and telecoms, you have to have this high availability and you have to have these guarantees that make the Erlang virtual machine re so reliable. And all of them are predicated upon the, the, what we talked about before with the schedulers. Um, and now you're essentially saying that you're building up these, these other schedulers that don't follow the same constraints. So now you're taking what was guaranteed under these certain constraints to move to these less certain constraints. So it's a big risk and a big change, and that's probably one of the reasons why it took four years to get uh, into OTP. And it was just released with OTP 21. Uh, before you can enable it with a config flag, but now it's enabled by default. Um, and this again, if we look at the observer, uh, here you have um, the big difference here, obviously. Now you have the dirty CPU, which are represented by dotted instead of solid lines. Um, so if you happen to notice that, that's what that is. Um, dirty schedulers can be either IO intensive or CPU intensive. Um, and this, is, this would make sense when you want to have something that, that would run for a longer period of time or something that you don't know exactly when it'll come back. And this is sort of the, the, the rationale for, for having dirty schedulers in the first place. Um, there's some dirty NIF flags. This is the Erlang. Uh, so you either have a CPU bound or an IO bound flag. Otherwise, it just uses the normal scheduler. And if we get back to this, uh, if we look at the, the diagram again, but we represent uh, with the uh, dirty I.O. and dirty CPU, you can see that it's essentially that there's a distinct queue and uh, scheduler for both I.O. and CPU, and then you have some number of regular schedulers. Let's see. 
So in some more characteristics of dirty schedulers, uh, dirty schedulers are unmanaged. So what does that mean, that dirty schedulers are unmanaged? They're not constrained the same way uh, that regular schedulers are with respect to long-running I.O. or CPU-intensive tasks. Uh, async threads, by the way, are also unmanaged. Um, the uh, only scheduler threads and some other threads are managed threads. And managed threads are the only threads that you're guaranteed to get information about. And these threads have to frequently post uh, report progress. And if you want to read more about uh, what managed threads are in thread progress, there's a link at the bottom. And as you know, dirty schedulers aren't free. Just because you have something that doesn't, ha that doesn't have the same constraints that regular schedulers do, that doesn't mean that, that you just can throw whatever you want at it. Um, you can use up resources. And if the resources are used up, then it blocks just like anything else. Um, here's an example of, of, uh, of using the dirty schedulers. Um, I'll, there's some links at the end that explain how to, how to get started with dirty schedulers. Um, but the thing that I want to point out from this case is that the, you see the dirty schedulers with the dotted lines that are, have, are being utilized there fully, even if it's just for a, uh, a second or so. But the regular threads are not used at all. So this, this gives credence to the fact that you can have these 30 schedulers that are operating, and the regular schedules, schedulers can, can continue to do what they need to do without any interruption or without uh, any problems. And some other interesting characteristics of, of dirty NIFs is that you can reschedule dirty NIFs from, so rescheduling means that you can uh, literally reschedule them and pick them up later. And you can also transition dirty schedulers to clean schedulers, and, and, or dirty NIFs to clean NIFs back and forth with this enif schedule NIF function. And there's a link there if you're curious about that. And then if you do happen to use dirty schedulers or if you're using or, or NIFs in general, um, this Erlang system monitor uh, long schedule allows you to, uh, to, set a, to set a time in milliseconds. So if you want your, if you want your NIF to return in a millisecond, then you can send it out, and if it exceeds that time link, then you'll get a message sent so that you can monitor what's going on. This is a nice way to investigate uh, drivers or NIFs that take too long to execute. And so that's, that's sort of an overview of dirty schedulers. Um, and all this is setting up for the, the bulk of the talk, which is about using Rust and dirty schedulers. But again, just to recap with dirty schedulers, there's two types of dirty schedulers, CPU and I, uh, CP, CPU and I.O., and they're independent and unmanaged, which means they don't have to report back. And just like any other schedule, they're resource constrained. And you can reschedule uh, dirty NIFs and move them from clean to dirty if you need to do that. So let's talk about Rust. Um, I, Rust is a, an interesting language. Um, it's, it's something that I've been curious about for my own personal reasons for quite a while. Um, it's not an easy language to learn, um, especially if you don't have a C or C++ background. Um, and just like you know, Erlang Elixir known for concurrency, fault tolerance, and various other bullet points, I'm going to go through some bullet points on Rust so that we can just get, th get through those um, in the same way that we would talk about Elixir. So first, unlike C, Rust is memory safe. Um, so, uh, and, and the way that Rust is memory safe is with a compiler. So you have, it's, it's a typed language. Um, and Rust can eliminate errors that are common sources of crashes in other languages because of this. And it was sort of a timely moment this morning when Jose was talking about uh, type specs. Um, are you fond of Dialyzer? If you don't like Dialyzer, you're not going to like Rust. Um, and uh, and if, I will assume that everyone here heard Jose's talk about the, the attempted type system in Elixir. And, and, uh, and the, because Rust, you, you don't have the option of, of, of typing. It's statically typed. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult to get that, um, from, especially about the C or C++ background, because you know, my background is JavaScript, Ruby, Elixir, Python. So these are very easy to get up and running. You can do some simple applications uh, really quickly, especially with, I think, with Elixir. Um, and you don't have to worry about pleasing the compiler entirely because it doesn't care about types. Um, Rust, on the other hand, will not let you even compile it if you have a missing type or an incorrect type. Uh, one of the most frustrating things is type conversion or intermediate types. So it's, I don't know, I guess I'm a bit of a masochist, but I, I do like this um, because in the same way that I like a seatbelt, right? Like a seatbelt or whatever safety systems are in your car. <laughs> like, I want to have these things in place because I don't trust myself to always be alert or to always understand what's going on. 
And so if I can hand off my mistakes or my potential mistakes to a compiler and say, make sure I'm doing this correctly, then that, that to me, seems like a worthwhile trade-off. Um, when I'm banging my head against the computer, that's not really, maybe that's not the same, same thing. But it, but it is very frustrating. And uh, in the Programming Rust book, which is an excellent book um, by O'Reilly, um, and again, I don't have a C++ or C background, but the author claims, or the authors claim that Rust is less cluttered with types than analogous C programs. And I don't know if that's true. The very little C that I know, I would feel like they're about the same. But so be it. Um, so if you don't like types, then Rust probably isn't for you. Um, and it claims that it's blazingly fast. And what that, what that essentially translates to is that it's on par with C. Um, you can control how things are represented in memory. And I uh, went to RustConf a few weeks ago. And I was talking with someone, and they were talking about, and a lot of the talks at RustConf were, were dealing with shaving off nanoseconds as opposed to milliseconds, which I thought was pretty wild. Um, and they were also talking about how uh, one, in order to optimize their program, they were pre-allocating all of the memory for the program from the very start of the program so that that would be the entire bit of the memory. And I, that was such a, a wild concept and something that was really, really cool to think about. Um, and then unlike dialyzer, uh, because dialyzer can check your types, can't optimize things, uh, using, you can optimize your types based on, the, on certain processors that you use, um, which is another interesting thing that we really don't have to do or consider when we use higher level languages. Um, and another important thing, just like memory safety, Rust is thread safety, or Rust has thread safety. Uh, so concurrency is, is, uh, is easy, well not easy, nothing is easy in Rust, but concurrency is, <laughs> concurrency is possible. And not, not only that is, is that it's possible, but it's guaranteed. Um, and I'm just going to quote from the, from the programming Rust book again. Uh, Most languages leave the relationship between a mutex, mutual exclusion, exclusion lock, and the data it's meant to protect to the comments. Rust can actually check at compile time that your code locks the mutex while it accesses the data. Most languages admonish you to be sure not to use a data structure yourself until you've given it to another thread. Rust checks that you don't. Rust is able to prevent data raises at compile time. So I like this quote for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it spells out explicitly why Rust is, why Rust is thread safety, has thread safety. Two, it's a bit tongue in cheek. Most languages admonish you not to be sure to use a data structure yourself, which is a bit like read, read the manual. But Rust, again, this is again like enforcing you when you get in the car, the seatbelt automatically, or the, the roller coaster, this, the, the harness automatically locks, and you're stuck until the end. And that, that I guess, is the same way with Rust. And so what all this boils down to, and this is sort of the catchphrase for Rust, is that it's safe C. Um, this is an easy way. It's just an easy thing to roll off the tongue um, in the sense that it's for the, for the characters you just described above. Um, but for me, that comes back to like Z, C++. That means nothing to me. Uh, I don't have the experience with C or C++. Um, I don't have a formal CS background. So I think a lot of people going with a formal CS background would understand these concepts willingly or, or readily because they had that, they had that um, built in to their degree. Um, but it's fun. Like, this is one of the reasons I enjoy programming so much is because it's unexplored territory, you're learning something new. And even though it is frustrating at times, there is the reward of having the, the code compile, which is, which is nice. Even if it's a really simple program, having the code compile is nice. Um, and finally, Rust builds, its, builds itself as systems programming. Um, and I think this is an interesting thing to describe because what is a system? Uh, Rust runs on microprocessors all the way up to web, all the way up to the web. I think there's five or six competing web frameworks on Rust now. Um, and it'll be interesting over the next few years to see how that works out to see if Rust continues to uh, expand into, into systems programming, literally meaning anything, or if it contracts into uh, finding niche markets like, like the microprocessors, like lower level stuff. Um, at, at RustConf, there were talks about uh, microprocessors, embedded software, the web, and, and everything in between. So I thought that was, that was really interesting uh, because I think Elixir and Erlang are really good because they focus on a, on a, on a, very, on a smaller subset of problems. Um, but of course, Rust uh, does not prevent logical errors. Um, and this is actually, this is a blog post, um, and you know, the, the, the code, I guess, is sort of readable there. But, uh, as Jose actually mentioned in this morning, uh, this morning about, about types, about them not preventing all bugs or all logical errors, uh, this post actually talks about ways to use traits in Rust to make sure that you can prevent these logical errors. So, and these simple functions, I mean, they're, they're re fairly readable, uh, converting from one the scale to another. And at the bottom, you have uh, let Fahrenheit equals 32. Um, so this type Fahrenheit is uh, float. 
and the type Celsius is also a, slow, a float. Um, or yes. So that works because the way that, because it, it, it still fits within that, those type definitions. But if, you, but if you read the article, it talks about ways to make sure that you can f further constrain these types. Um, so that's a quick overview of Rust. So now we're going to talk about Rustler. Um, and this is the interesting part for me, um, at least how it relates to Elixir. So Rustler is a safe Rust bridge for creating Erlang NIF functions. And if you want to know about Rustler, I recommend you watching Sunny's talk, Taking Elixir to the Middle. He's right there. Um, and he has a shorter beard now. Um, and, uh, but it, so, it's, so what's really good about this talk is that it, it gives you, it, it shows how to, as I mentioned earlier, about C functions not properly are running more, more cycles uh, and, few, and fewer reductions than they're actually running. Uh, Sunny goes, walks through examples of how to find out and how to more accurately measure those, those reductions. And it's also a really nice overview of, of using Elixir with Rustler and NIFS. So that sort of brings us to the last section of uh, the last bit of, of, talk, of the talk. Um, so now I want to talk about dirty schedulers with Rustler. So here's some code, um, and we're going to walk through this at a high level just to give you an idea of, of Rust, Rust code. And we'll start out here. Um, so I want to draw attention to, the, to these. First, you have an enum, which is essentially enum in, enum in other languages. Second, um, that dirty IO equals two comma. It's convention to have a comma after even the last one. I'm not sure why, but I guess it's consistent. Um, then the fn is the function keyword. And you notice that there's pub in front of both. Everything in Rust is private by default, pretty much. So that means that, that structs are private, methods are private, traits are private. So you, and this is sort of the idea. Uh, Rust is a very conservative language in that way, that you have to be explicit about what you want to do, which, again, I think goes back to the, to the safety. And I like that as well. It, the, you can have less problems if you have to explicitly think, say the things that you want to do. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is that just like with the Erlang scheduler flags, you have, uh, you have them enumerated here as normal dirty CPU and dirty IO. So when you use these flags, you tell the Erlang VM which kind of, which kind of uh, NIF it is. And then here, as I mentioned earlier, statically typed. So you have, three, you have two uh, inputs, a function of rd2 that it returns a Boolean. So I personally like this a lot. As I mentioned before, it's very obvious what's going on. Um, you can see that the percent is a integer. It returns a Boolean. And the environment, A and V, I believe, is a struct. So you can get a lot of information without documenting the function at all. Um, and this is objective documentation. And this is one of the reasons why I like Dialyzer as well, because it's objective. No one can, like, I can write a, a function definition and think it's great, and someone can read it and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And this is a much clearer way of doing that, and it's an objectively measurable one. Um, this interesting syntax, this is where all the problems happen for me. Uh, these are lifetimes. So um, the, the uh, braces and the apostrophe signify a lifetime, and the letter A is just by convention. It can be any letter. Um, I'm not sure. It might even be able to be any number of characters, but the convention is to use A or to use whatever lifetimes to, um, to match whatever other lifetimes are. So briefly, lifetimes guarantee that no reference can outlive itself or be referred to by another reference, if that makes sense. So you know, in C, you have, um, uh, you, know, you have the null pointer exception or these kind of things, and, and lifetimes and the compiler will guarantee that you don't have that. Um, and it's a, it is a bit difficult because there are all sorts of, and I think this is probably the, the path of a maturing Rust developer in the sense that you know, when I, you start using Rust, you clone everything or you make references to everything, uh, you give lifetimes to everything, and then as you um, sort of start to incorporate the Rust way of doing things, uh, you start to do things in a more elegant way, but I'm not anywhere near that yet. Um, and then you don't have to do lifetimes on everything. There's a thing called lifetime elision, and lifetime elision is what you expect when something is elided in the sense that you don't have to explicitly say that. And there are three, un three unambiguous and easily memorizable rules. Um, I haven't memorized them, so I guess they can't be that easily memorizable. <laughs> but they're in the Rust book if you want to see what they are. Um, and they're, they're kind of intuitive, I guess. Um, and then here's how you declare a variable in, in Rust. Uh, with a let keyword, uh, variables are immu immutable by default. Um, add the mute, M-U-T keyword to make them mutable. 
Um, and this, I want to point out that uh, this is struct that has a method, so there are methods um, in, uh, in Rust. So Rust has both object-oriented and functional properties. Um, and then Rust has statements and expressions. So a statement is an instruction that performs an action and doesn't return a value, and an expression evaluates to some, to some value. And then the last bit that I want to point out here is this unsafe keyword. Um, this is, an, I guess, I don't know if this is an exact analogy or even a good analogy, but unsafe is, I guess, equivalent to a NIF in the sense that you give up some guarantees, potentially, when you use unsafe. Um, so, and this is from the, the Rust core team's book. Um, and I think this is a nice explanation of why and when to use Rust and why or when to use unsafe and why unsafe exists at all. So unsafe Rust exists because by nature static analysis is conservative. And this goes back to the point of being memory safe and thread safe. So if, if it's in doubt, then reject it. Um, and the consequences of using unsafe incorrectly means that you can have the same problems you have with C in terms of null pointer referencing, memory unsafety, and other things. Um, and going back to the original point, or when I was talking about systems program with Rust, how uh, Rust operates from the hardware to the web. So Rust has an unsafe, Rust has unsafe because underlying computer hardware is inherently unsafe. I mean, you can talk to Justin or Frank or anyone who works on hardware about the, all the problems they have with hardware. So I think that's an interesting way to do that. Um, and if you, have to use, if you have to use unsafe, the way to do that is to have a safe API that that isolates that unsafe, unsafe bit. And I'm not making a, a judgment on whether or not to use unsafe is right here. I'm assuming that it's the correct way to do things. It's just I want to point out to you what that means um, so that you can make that judgment or you can understand what's going on so that if you see unsafe in the program, you understand that there's some guarantees that you're potentially losing. So now let's tie all this together into dirty functions. Um, and I'm going to use some examples from the Rustler library just because um, they think they're, they're concise and they get the point across. So uh, these are the Rust tests for dirty CPU and dirty I.O. Um, and to do make these realistic, I think that's funny. But I also think that um, I'm not sure how, I mean, I think the dirty CPU, I can, I can come up with an idea of how to make that realistic. But the dirty I.O., that's a bit more difficult, I think. Um, so if we recall back to the first part when I was talking about schedulers and the time slice of one millisecond, so all these functions, they do the exact same thing, and they just sleep for 100 milliseconds. So that's 100 times what uh, the time slice should be. And, and I think it, and an interesting experiment would be, because very easily you can do these, you can make these functions. I mean, just because they're called dirty CPU or dirty, dirty I.O., um, you can make these regular NIFs. So you could, you could, have, you could exploit these functions to cause some strange behavior with the Erlang VM. And so you can have these run as clean NIFs and run them as dirty NIFs and compare the, compare the results. And so to use, uh, to use these functions, you have to uh, bring into scope the scheduler flags. Um, so scheduler flags are, are the enum that I showed you earlier. And the highlighted bits are the two dirty CPU, func dirty CPU and dirty IO functions. Um, and I just want to read a what, what the flags are, or what, or what these fields are. So dirty CPU, dirty IO, those are the names, the Elixir names. Uh, zero is the arity. And test dirty, dirty CPU is the location of the function in the Rust code. And then finally, you have the scheduler flags that, that specify dirty CPU and dirty IO. And then if you look at the, the, um, the functions above, or the tuples above, I guess, um, you can see that they only have three arguments. So again, the first one is the name in Elixir, the second one is the arity, and the third one is the location in the Rust file. And there's no uh, scheduler flags. So by default, uh, Rustler assumes that you, uh, you mean a clean NIF. And then this is how you use these. You can just, this is, the, these are, this is Elixir code, obviously. Um, there's, a bit, there's a bit missing um, where you have to declare another use to, to, you, to tell the to tell uh, Mix where, or the, your application where to find the, um, the Rust, Rust libraries, or the Rust libraries, the NIFs. Um, but again, I have some links at the, at the end that will enumerate these uh, you know, in detail. So that sort of wraps up about Rust um, and why I think it's a, an interesting language. And, and even though it's difficult, I still think it's worth it. So ask me again in six months. We'll see if I haven't improved in six months, and I probably won't improve after that. But hopefully, with some determination, I will be better in six months. So this brings us to the last bit. And so I, I like to tie talks into, into practical application in the sense like, you know, I can talk about this from an abstract point of view, but how does this actually help, help you? 
Like, do we, should we, do we use NIFs at BR? Do we, should you use NIFs in your job? And I've already alluded that, yes, we do use NIFs with Jiffy. Um, but if you can, I mean, most, most companies now probably use service-oriented architecture. I mean, we do. Um, so if you can keep them separate, if you, if you can use you know, gRPC, ETF, or whatever protocol you want to talk to between services, then that's probably the ideal solution because you don't have to give up the guarantees or, or mingle the waters between the different services. And you don't risk violating any guarantees at all. Um, and it's also, they're also more composable, so you can do different things with them. But in the case, like I mentioned earlier, one of our apps we found surprisingly that the most time was spent encoding and decoding JSON. There's, nothing, there's no way we can do to, to get around that. Um, it's essentially part of the application. It wouldn't make any sense to call out to another application to decode, encode the JSON, and come back. So, so if, you, if you have that, then you have to do the, There's no way around that. Um, so if that's the case, you know, C or Rust. I mean, to me, the answer is clear. You would use Rust um, just because even if you, I mean, I guess it depends on the makeup of the development team that you have or the, or the, the guarantees that you need to provide to your customers or to other businesses. Um, but the, it stands clear to me that Rust is by far a superior language, both in terms of the guarantees that it offers and also the tooling that it has. Um, but this is from a web perspective. From a hardware perspective, it might, might be different. I was talking with, with Frank um, on the Nerves team about this, and he was saying that, that Rust has some interesting um, components, but the tooling around C, because it's been developed for so much longer, is much more robust. And so for his purposes, even though Rust is a compelling, Argument for him, uh, C is the tool that he'll use. And finally, so what about, are we going to use Rust at BR? I mean, short answer, no. Long answer, yes, with a but. Um, so I guess there are a couple of things, right? Like Rust is really, for command line utilities, Rust would be great because you can create a binary and just distribute it to whoever needs it. Those don't, those don't change very often. You don't need to have many people working on command line utilities necessarily. And if we need to use NIFs, if for whatever reason we had some requirement that we needed to use a NIF, then I would, of course, write it in Rust, um, both because uh, I don't know that we have any C developers at work, and I, don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable using C if I could use Rust instead. Um, but for web development in general or for server-side stuff, um, it, it does, it's not a compelling argument, or it's not a compelling reason for me to use that or to, to recommend that. One, because there are probably more people at work who would write pony over Rust, so that's one thing. Like, it would be a hard thing to, to do, because I think, I think there are two people who want to write Rust at, at BR and three pony. Um, and, and I took a training at RustConf to, use, to learn about Rocket, because it's like, if you know web, I was like, oh, I know web frameworks and I know some Rust, so I should be, a, so I should be able, no problem. Uh, it, was a, it was a hard lesson to see how poorly I could do web development with Rust. Um, and also, it's a matter of bringing people together. Like, how are we going to, the reason we adopted Elixir so successfully was because we had buy-in from everyone, uh, from the management and from the developers, and we're not going to have that same buy-in. So, yes to use Rust for NIFs, uh, probably no for development at BR. Um, so here are a couple links uh, if you want to get, so, so this is more detail about actually how to set up stuff and how to use some dirty schedulers. Um, I can send this out on a tweet later. Um, image credits, if you like vaporware or glitch stuff. Uh, here are some resources. All of these I highly recommend if you're curious about this kind of stuff. And I think that is time. <laughs>